If I were to ask you why Christians observe the Lord's Supper, what would you say? Not what does it mean, and not why is it important, but why do we do it? Probably the answer that comes first to your mind would be because Jesus told us to. And you would be correct. And we can say the same thing about the practice of baptism. We do it because Jesus told us to, and he set the example. But those are not the only two things that Jesus told us to do. He also told us to wash one another's feet. So why don't we have occasional foot washings, just like we have occasional baptisms and observe the Lord's Supper? Why is it that Christians of all stripes at all times have recognized the significance of baptism and the Lord's Supper as something the church should practice regularly, but you don't see, hardly ever see, Christians practicing literal foot washing with any regularity. Now, there is a good reason, and I'm not saying we should be practicing foot washing. I just want to get you thinking about the passage before we dig into it. We're going to look this morning at John 13, verses 1 to 17, and I want you to be thinking about what it is that Jesus is modeling for us and what it is that he is calling upon us to do. If there are good reasons why we don't literally imitate the example of Jesus here, and we'll see some of those later, there are good reasons why we don't do that, then what is it that he is asking us to do? What is it that he is modeling for us? And what is it that is so significant about this act that Jesus does in John 13? So let me read for us Verses 1 through 17 of John 13. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, Do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now, with the beginning of chapter 13, we have entered into the final hours of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, John 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 are an extended look at the last moments, the last hours that Jesus was able to spend with his disciples just before he went to the cross. So he's spending time with his disciples 
just before the Passover, and John pulls back the veil for us, not only on this intimate meeting between Jesus and his disciples as Jesus imparts to them his last instruction, his, uh, one of his last examples, but also pulls back the veil on what it is or what it was that Jesus knew even as he prepared to serve his disciples and ultimately go to the cross. We've already seen, and John reminds us here again in chapter 13 in verse 1, that Jesus knew that his hour had come. He knew that the moment he had been preparing for his whole life, the very reason why he had come, his death on the cross, he knew that that hour had come. He knew that he would be departing out of the world, John tells us, and going to the Father. So he knew not only that he was about to leave, that his time had come, but he also knew where he was going. He knew that he was going to the presence of his Father. And he knew, John tells us in verse 3, that the Father had given all things into his hands. He knew that the Father had entrusted to him everything. There was nothing the Father had withheld from him. And perhaps most significantly, he tells us in the second half of verse 3 that he knew that he had come from God and was going back to God. If you ever wondered, did Jesus know? Did Jesus somehow remember? Was he aware of the fact that he was not merely a man, but that he was the Son of God in the flesh? Did he know that? Did he know that he had been with the Father from eternity before he came and humbled himself and was born as a man of the Virgin Mary? Did he know that? John answers that question without hesitation and without a doubt. Jesus absolutely knew it. He knew who he was. He knew where he had come from and he knew where he was going. And that Knowledge makes what he is about to do all the more dramatic and marvelous and amazing. This Jesus, who not only was God in the flesh, but was aware, fully aware that he was God in the flesh, he loved his disciples. John tells us there that having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That word can mean the end as in the end of a, of a, like a series, a sequence, the end of a, a set period of time. Or it can mean to love to the uttermost, to the full. We don't have to decide which one John intended there because they're both true. As Jesus approached the end of his earthly ministry, his time on earth with his disciples... He didn't sort of draw a line and say, I've done enough, I've poured out enough, I've loved you enough, I'm done. It's time for some me time, right? He didn't do that. He loved them all the way to the end of his ministry. But he also loved them to the uttermost, to the full. There was no love that Jesus withheld from them. There was no extent of the demonstration of love that Jesus drew back from, I love you this much, but not that much. There was no amount, no demonstration of love that Jesus refrained from showing to his disciples. Even though they didn't fully understand how he was loving them. There's a particular difficulty and showing love to someone in a way that they don't understand. Right? Parents experience this all the time. You show love to your kids in ways that you know that they don't get. Sometimes they feel like what you're doing is, is bad. They don't like it, right? When actually what you're doing is loving. And you know eventually they'll understand it. But it might be 20 years or so before they understand the way that you're loving them. Or perhaps... You may be loving a parent who has um, become unable to care for themselves. Maybe they 
aren't even always aware of what is going on and you are loving them, serving them, caring for them in what may be the last days or weeks or months or years of their life. And it's hard because you know they don't even fully understand what you're doing for them. Jesus loved his disciples like that. They didn't know. They didn't fully understand what he was doing. It takes a certain depth of love, a certain commitment, a certain amount of hope or confidence to love that way. And Jesus had all those things. He was committed to his disciples. He was certain what the fruit would be of the love that he was showing. He knew that they would understand eventually. He had a depth of love that we cannot even begin to fully plumb in our minds and hearts because it's boundless. But Jesus loved his disciples to the full. He loved his disciples to the end. And he loved them even in this act of service that we see in verse 4 and 5, knowing what he knew about himself, knowing who he was, where he'd come from, where he was going, rather than puffing himself up, rather than reminding his disciples of how important and significant he was and calling upon them to serve him, he takes upon himself the position, the disposition, even the dress of a servant. He removes his outer clothing. He puts a towel around his waist. He prepares a basin of water. And he goes to his disciples one by one and washes their feet. Perhaps the most dramatic demonstration of love the world has ever seen, second only to Jesus' death on the cross. Because Jesus is the highest one, and yet has put himself in the lowest place, the, the place of a servant, and probably the lowest of the servants, as the one who would wash nasty, stinky, filthy feet. I mean, who likes to touch anybody else's feet besides their own? Almost nobody, right? And we wear socks and shoes. They're just wearing sandals. So you can only imagine what their feet must have been like. And yet Jesus takes their feet in his hands, washes them, cleanses them, wipes them on the towel that he has wrapped around himself. And he does this because he loves them. Because he wants them to understand something about not only what he's doing in this moment, but what he is about to do. What is so amazing about Jesus' love is not just what he says or just what he feels, but what he does. He shows his love in ways that cannot be denied, in ways that are unexpected and profound. And he does this for many reasons, one of which is this. If you feel like your sin has so defiled you, has made you so unclean, that you feel like God would look at you and say, I'm not touching that person. I'm not getting close to that person. I don't want anything to do with that person. They're just gross, nasty, too unclean for me. Part of what Jesus is doing in washing his disciples' nasty, defiled feet is he's telling you, and not just telling you, but showing you, you can't be too unclean for me to be willing to touch you, to cleanse you. Jesus touched lepers that nobody else wanted to get close to and made them clean. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, a, a job nobody would want and only servants likely would be compelled to do. 
He did it. He did all those things to show us that our defilement, our sin, does not turn Him away from us. Your sin, your uncleanness is why He came. He came to make you clean. He came to cleanse you. And that, in part, is what He is showing His disciples and showing us in this great act of humility. Now, as he's doing this, we're not surprised that Peter speaks up. Peter uh, often has something to say about whatever is going on. And Peter says to Jesus, I don't think so. You're, you're not washing my feet. And he says that most likely because he sees how backward this is. If anything, Peter likely thinks, I should be washing Jesus' feet. He shouldn't be washing my feet. It's not unlike when Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized, and John the Baptist says, well, hold on a minute. If anybody should be doing the baptizing here, Jesus, it's you baptizing me, not me baptizing you. Peter says, you're not washing my feet. In fact, in verse 8, he says it so strongly, he says, you shall never wash my feet. It's just not going to happen. But Jesus says to him, in verse 7, what I am doing to you, you do not understand now. But afterward, you will understand. It's as though he says, Peter, I get that this seems backward to you. I get that this seems wrong to you. I get that you don't fully understand what I'm doing and why this matters. You will understand it later. You're just going to have to trust me. You're just going to have to trust me. You will understand what I'm doing in time. But Peter still objects, right, in verse 8 after that. But what changes Peter's mind is what Jesus says in the middle of verse 8. He says to Peter, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now, whatever Peter's faults were, and he had them, right? Peter was sold out for Jesus. Peter loved Jesus. Peter was committed to Jesus. He wanted to be with Jesus no matter what. He was willing to go down fighting with Jesus. And so when Jesus says, Peter, you're going to have to let me do this. Because if you don't let me wash you, you've got no part in me, no part with me. Then Peter does a total 180 and says, great, wash my feet, wash my head, wash my hands. I want to be all in, wash it all. But Jesus says, no, you don't need that. In verse 10, he says, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean. right? So Jesus is implying, Peter, you, you've already been cleansed, but you do still need to have your feet washed. Now, what is this all about? Because it's almost like Jesus is talking in some kind of code. And in a sense, he is. He he tells his disciples there's more going on right now than what you can grasp, what you can understand. This is not just about washing feet. If it was just about washing feet, they could get that. But there's more going on. We cannot forget that this moment takes place in the shadow of the cross, literally hours before Jesus dies. And what the disciples don't understand yet, but will soon understand, is that this washing of their feet is about the effect of Jesus' death on his disciples. That's what this is really about. It is about the cleansing that comes from Jesus shedding his blood on the cross. Now you say, well, how do you make that connection? Well, here, think about what Jesus is doing. In this moment, in a great act of humility, Jesus is loving his disciples 
in one of the most humbling ways he can. Serving them in one of the most dramatic ways that he can. Does that not form the best image short of actually laying down his life that Jesus could possibly give them for what he's about to do on the cross? Because what he's about to do on the cross is to humble himself as lowly as he can, serve his disciples in love in a way they don't fully understand so that they will be clean. And that's what he's doing. That's what the cross is, and that's what the foot washing is about. It is a picture of what Jesus is accomplishing and how he is accomplishing it. Cleansing his people through a humble act of of love. That's what washing their feet is all about. That's what they don't yet understand, but will soon understand. That's what Jesus is doing. Now, he says, after all this, in verse 12, do you understand what I have done to you? And they just told them they don't understand. They're not going to understand Yet, but he wants them to be thinking about it. And there's a part of it that they can grasp even now in this moment, even though the full meaning won't land on them until later. He says to them, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. So I'm your rabbi, I'm your teacher, I'm your Lord, you're right to call me those things. I'm in a position over you a position of respect and authority. That's right. So here's what I want you to understand. He says, verse 14, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Here's what he's saying. Anyone who needs their feet washed, anyone who needs a humble act of service performed for them, I don't want any of you to ever think that act of service is beneath you because of your position. Well, I'm an apostle. I don't have to do that kind of thing. I'm one of Jesus' chosen disciples. We'll get other people to do that kind of stuff. Jesus says, nope. If I did it, you can do it. If I did it, you've got no excuse for why you shouldn't do it, or can't do it, or shouldn't have to do it. I have given you an example as your Lord and teacher, the one you follow, the one you learn from. Now that I've done it, you have to imitate me. That's what it means to be my disciple. And so if I've done it, now you need to do it. Now, I said at the beginning, I don't think Jesus is saying here that we should literally have regular foot washings. Why not? Because it does seem, he does seem to say pretty plainly, this is something I expect you to do. So why don't churches do this all the time? Why, why haven't Christians been doing this? Well, there are several good reasons, I think, why People do do this occasionally, but it's not something at the level of like baptism and the Lord's Supper that we know every church needs to be doing this often. The first reason why is because Jesus speaks about what he is doing and tells us about what he is doing, that it's it's more than the action itself, it's symbolizing something more, right? Now that's true of baptism and the Lord's Supper as well. Baptism is a a picture, right, of our union with Christ, that we die with Him, we have been raised to new life with Him, we're now publicly identified with Him. The Lord's Supper, we are, uh, those elements remind us of Jesus' body, Jesus' blood shed for us on the cross. Those Those are symbolic too, But the second reason why this is not something we do often, like baptism and the Lord's Supper, is because um, 
baptism and the Lord's Supper show up in one way or another in all four of the Gospels. Right? Jesus being baptized, John baptizing people, Jesus baptizing people. Jesus has the Last Supper with his disciples in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't record that event, but he hints at it in, uh, in a way in John chapter 6. So we see those in one way or another in all four of the Gospels. And then also in the book of Acts, there's people baptizing uh, new believers all through the book of Acts. Uh, we also see hints of them uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper when they talk about breaking bread together uh, and, and so on. Uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about baptizing people. He talks about uh, the instructions he received about the Lord's Supper that he passed on to the church there. So it's really clear through a, a, a number of examples and instructions that those things are really significant. But we never see any incident of foot washing outside of John 13. No examples of it in the book of Acts. No other occasion when it occurs in the other Gospels. Uh, it just it doesn't happen. It only occurs here in John 13. In fact, the next reason is there's only one other place that I know of foot washing even being mentioned in the New Testament, and that's in 1 Timothy 5, where Paul's giving instructions about... Uh, which women should be uh, enrolled in the church's list of widows that they're supposed to be caring for on a regular basis. And what he says is, let a widow be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. Now, even if he's literally talking there about washing people's feet, which I don't even think he is. I think he's using that language there symbolically and metaphorically as well to talk about serving others in, in humble and sacrificial ways. Even if he is talking about literal foot washing, that would be an odd thing to say about a particular individual if that was something the church did corporately. Right? You wouldn't say, if this woman has washed the feet of the saints... You know, that, that's part of what qualifies her if that's what everybody does in the church. So th there's no indication outside of John 13 that this is something uh, that the church practiced or understood Jesus to expect us to practice on a regular basis. And the practice of the church from the early centuries to now confirms that. Because with some exceptions, there's... Hardly any Christians throughout the history of the church who have practiced this as a as a you know an ordinance regularly. It's just um, not a widespread practice, and I think that's because people have understood that what Jesus meant here is not that I literally want you to wash one another's feet. What I want you to do is humbly and sacrificially and lovingly serve each other. And let's be honest, as uncomfortable as you would be, and I would be, literally washing somebody else's feet, it's even harder to consistently, sacrificially, humbly serve people in the hundreds and thousands of ways that people need to be served. So Jesus says in verse 17, this is the, where we'll stop. He says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you understand, in other words, I take him to mean, if you understand that you are meant to go and serve each other, humble yourselves to do for others things that technically you don't have to do, that may be a little uncomfortable for you to do, they may be humbling for you to do, it may feel like you're kind of you might feel like you're above doing this kind of thing, but you understand that I'm telling you now that you need to do this. It's not knowing it that will bring blessing into your life. It's doing it. It's not enough just to know what I've said. You need to go and do what I have told you to do. And there's a thousand ways to do this. Right, preparing a meal for someone who's in a hard season. 
stopping by to visit someone who lives alone or isn't able to get out much or just needs a friend, running an errand for somebody, taking care of a project for someone who can't do it themselves, sending a note to someone who's sick or you just haven't seen in a while, preparing to teach Sunday school and serve children and families. and I mean, you can just go on and on and on. What Jesus is saying is among my followers, I don't want any of you to think that you are here to be served rather than to serve. And he tells his disciples that elsewhere. He had some disciples who had some uh, ambition to high position and power, and Jesus said, look, I didn't come here to be served. I came here to serve and to lay down my life as a ransom for many. You also are called to serve. Doing these kinds of things, serving others in humble and self-sacrificial love will, will cost you something. And some of those things will cost you more than others, but love is costly. It just is, in all of its forms. And Jesus has shown us the most costly example of love and has called us to follow his example. John even sums it up for us in his letter that we call 1 John. When he says this, and I almost want to think that John had this moment in his mind as he was writing these words. But he says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Now, are you literally going to die physically for a brother or sister in Christ? Probably not. Probably not. That would be extremely rare. It happens. But you would probably not ever be called upon to do that. But that doesn't mean you're not called upon to lay down your life. Because every time you serve, every time you put somebody else's needs ahead of your own, every time in the name of Jesus, following the example of Jesus, you humbly, sacrificially serve someone, you are laying down your life for them. Like Jesus laid down his life for us. Let's pray.